Good morning or afternoon, as the case may be, and a very warm welcome from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country here in Canberra, Australia. Happy Library and Information Week to those in Australia too. As your host, um, I pay my respects to the traditional custodians and kaitiaki of the many lands from which our panellists and participants join us today. Welcome. My name is Barbara Lemon. I'm Executive Officer for NSLA, National and State Libraries Australasia, and I was raised on Wurundjeri land in Victoria. I'll be facilitating this webinar co-hosted by our friends at OCLC. So today, as you know, we're here to learn about a project called Reimagine Descriptive Workflows. It was established by OCLC with support from the Mellon Foundation in order to better understand and address harm caused by cultural institutions, metadata and collection description practices. Over the last uh, year and a half, the project has convened an international group of experts and practitioners to determine ways of improving descriptive practices, tools, infrastructure and workflows in libraries and archives. And the result is a published community agenda, which I hope you've all had the chance to read. Uh, and today we'll look at how that agenda can apply to libraries and archives in our region. Most of us work for what the project names power holding institutions in a, in a sector of predominantly white employees. Um, if you're attending this webinar, chances are that you understand that very well uh, and that you want to better understand how we can shift the balance. The fact that there are more than 400 people registered today is a terrific sign. So to help us, we have a wonderful panel and I'm going to introduce them briefly now. Uh, Merrilee Prophet is a senior manager in the OCLC Research Library Partnership. She was a leading figure in this project, the Reimagined Descriptive Workflows project, and has worked on a range of other research projects about respectful practice in cataloguing relating to Indigenous peoples. Katrina Tamira and Damien Webb uh, were both members of the Reimagined Descriptive Workflows Advisory Group. Katrina is Research Librarian Māori for the Alexander Turnbull Library at the National Library of New Zealand, uh, working in arrangement and description, and she belongs to the iwi Ngāti Tūwharatoa. Damien is a Palawa man and manager of the Indigenous Engagement Branch at the State Library of New South Wales. Also joining us is Rebecca Bateman, a Whalewan and Gamilaroi woman who is Acting Director of Indigenous Engagement at the National Library of Australia. To complete the circle, Rebecca and Damien are also members of ALIA's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Expert Advisory Group. So before throwing questions to the panel, um, and we will have Q&A as well built into this, um, please do, as we go, pop your, your questions into the Q&A um, box there at the bottom of your screen and we'll pick those up and get as many through to the panel as possible. Um, but beforehand, I'm going to, to throw to Merrily Prophet to give us a, a brief introduction to the project itself, um, just so that we all have the context we need for this conversation. Over to you, Merrily. Thank you so much, Barb, for that very warm welcome. And I'm um, so very pleased to be here with you today to share just a little bit of background on the project. Um, so I'm going to be giving a, a review of the work done by OCLC with support from the Mellon Foundation, as mentioned, um, and the project was undertaken to better understand and address harms caused by cultural institutions collective descriptions. Um, so this is really a uh, covering the funded phase of the work. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging that I live and work on the traditional land of the Chechen Alani people in what is now known as Oakland, California. And I am grateful to the past and present stewards of this land. Um, and uh, for more information about um, the Alani people, I encourage you to check out the Segurate Land Trust. Um, this is, I'm really inspired by the uh, indigenous women who lead this effort to rematriate the land that I live on. Um, I am coming to you, as I mentioned, from Oakland, California. Um, I am not an expert in the topic of racism and exclusion and its impacts, but I am witness to it and I'm always trying to learn and educate myself and to do better as I think we all are. Um, and I'm very privileged to share what I have learned with you today and also privileged to be joined by um, our, our true experts who are uh, in the in the discussant panel um, today. Um, so the reimagined 
descriptive workflows project convened a group of experts, practitioners, community members to determine ways to improve descriptive practices, tools, infrastructure, and workflows in libraries and archives. The result, the community agenda is offered to the broad community of practice and draws together insights from the convening as well as related research and operational work that is ongoing in the field today. One of our radical assertions is that all institutions hold power to make meaningful changes in this space and all share collective responsibility. So part of our how is all of us, those of us attending this meeting today and others who have yet to step into this space to consider the possibilities for transformation. The agenda, if you have read it, you will know it is not a how-to guide, but it is constructed to uh, instruct and chart a path towards reparative and inclusive description and is divided into two distinct parts. The first part is contextual information regarding the project, the convening, and the methods used to create the agenda. And it also helps, we hope, to uh, frame the historical, local, and workflow challenges and also the many tensions that should be considered when uh, approaching this inclusive and reparative metadata work. And then the second part of the uh, agenda is this framework of guidance that suggests actions and exercises that can help frame institutions' local priorities and areas for change and also provide examples to inspire local work. So as I said, this is not a how-to or a step-by-step -step guide for what needs to be done because it's really just much more complicated than that, uh, but instead upholds the many issues that are at play and the need to build capacity for solutions. So we hope to uh, help in this report support change from leadership right through to individual practitioners. So the motivation to advance inclusive and reparative metadata work is really grounded in the observation that more inclusive descriptive data drives a more inclusive discovery experience. And the community of library and archival practitioners and other stewards of metadata, we have really been falling short of our goals to be inclusive and welcoming to all. Um, and I think that this is really summarized very nicely in the catalogers code of ethics, um, an international document that was published in 2021 um, that says, and I quote, cataloging standards and practices are currently and historically characterized by racism, white supremacy, colonialism, othering and oppression. So this is such a large challenge that we believe it required a level of creative thinking and also the courage to re-examining existing practices and service in the spirit of reducing harm and expanding the circle of inclusivity. So we brought together these, these two concepts, um, reimagining and also this, uh, this, this idea that this should be really a, a radical um, undertaking. And uh, we really want to uphold the work of our advisory board who very much uh, led and set the terms for this work. Uh, the advisory board met numerous times ahead of the convening to help prioritize our areas of focus to identify how the work should be structured. And, uh, and then after the convening met numerous times to give feedback and to help guide uh, numerous drafts of the of the agenda that that we have before us so so much gratitude to uh to those who helped to lead this work and also to um, our energetic group of attendees and one of the important things that our um advisory board did was to help lay the goals for the three days that we would spend together and uh this wasn't a you know get her done kind of kind of agenda. It was really to create this safe space for connecting and sharing honestly um, and right through to uh, help lay the foundation to keep the conversation going. And I'm so pleased to be with partners from NASLA doing just that exactly that exact thing today, keeping this conversation going. So the framework of guidance um, may be remedial for some and may be revolutionary for others. 
because descriptive practices reflects library or institutional practice, this is really, as I said previously, the work of all of us in libraries and cultural heritage institutions, not just catalogers alone. And while it is vitally important that we hire and also retain people of color within our institutions, these are not issues for those people alone to solve. Allies need to be substantially invested in and supportive of this work. So uh, we have three categories of work where we believe traction is needed to affect change. Um, at the top level, we need leadership to invest in restructuring priorities and resourcing priorities. At the operational level, we need to shift uh, in a real way to inclusive and reparative practice in the day to day, which also requires leadership report, especially support, especially for mid level managers and practitioners. And because we all have a role to play investment in professional and personal development will help and su vitally support this mind shift um, for in both personal and professional practice. So those are the three areas that the um, that the agenda is structured in. So uh, I'm just gonna pull out a couple of examples from the, um, uh, from the agenda. So at this, at this um, or organizational shifts, championing the need for anti-racist and anti-oppressive approaches and descriptive practice really needs to be a labor that is shared by everyone in the organization and should not fall to a single committee um, not the, and not the work of the few that have already been working in the area. Um, these are structures that resist change, so leaders must provide the scaffolding uh, and clear messaging that supports the change over the long term, while also recognizing the urgency of this issue. Um, there is, we should recognize, pressure on organizations to be constantly innovated innovating, and funding models, public interest, political support tend to favor the new and shall I say shiny, which encourages a proliferation of projects that may um, never be finished or may language when they hit a maintenance phase. Ongoing efforts supported by shifts in budget allocation, staffing, workflows, and measures of productivity and performance are needed to be reshaped to sustain the push for foundational change for operational work over the long time. And this uh, shift is best achieved when it is supported by a critical mass of institutions throughout this ecosystem so that it's not just one standout institution, but that we're all moving in a similar direction and supporting one another. Um, here in under operational workflows, one of the things that was uh, called out was that we don't often have feedback processes uh, built into library discovery layers that allow users to report problematic language. In previous research, one of the things that we had learned was that catalogers feel can feel quite disconnected um, from uh, from from user feedback. Um, so. One of the examples that we uphold in the report is uh, both the National Library of Australia catalog, as well as the Trove Discovery Portal, um, do have those uh, at least nascent mechanisms for reporting culturally sensitive content and or problematic language. Um, so this is something that we can that we have heard a call for, um, but that uh, we, we see kind of early signals playing out that this is something that is indeed achievable. Um, uh, and I will just go on from there. Um, under uh, operational workflows, one of the things that was called out many, many times, and this was both in, in research as well as in the convening, is that we really need to uh, not be doing this uh, cataloging description to people, but with people, and that uh, community engagement approaches that are non-extractive and truly community-centered are are what is what is really really called for um, here. Um, and finally, uh, along in the personal and professional uh, area is this need for creating systems of support. So work around topics that are linked to racism, othering, and erasure is difficult, time-consuming, and emotional work. 
And it is really essential to build strong and multi-layered structures of support for the people who are involved in this work. Um, we see a significant need for mentoring relationships that provide reciprocal benefit for emerging mid-career and late career professionals, as well as those who are in leadership positions and who hold power to help everyone better understand the diversity of uh, constituents and, um, and inputs. So recognition, buy-in and funding from organizations and individuals with power and influence at all levels is really crucial. So librarianship is we think primarily a learning profession and we are never done learning. Um, so that is uh, a brief introduction and I am very much looking forward to the discussion. Stop sharing, thanks. Thanks so much, Marilee. That's terrific uh, as an introduction and a, a nice bit of context to get everybody's head into this uh, before we start the conversation. Um, I'll invite the panelists to, to switch on their, um, their cameras and, and mute themselves so that we can have a chat together. And as we do go through this session, uh, please do, I see, um, Alison, thank you for, for kicking off the Q&A there. Um, please do add your questions to the Q&A so that I can come to those after we've had a chance for a, a bit of a, a talk between ourselves. Um, and if we can't get to anything that you've asked us today, then we can do so in uh, a blog post subsequently. So I wanted to start with, well, Damien and Katrina, you were both part of the, uh, the advisory group for the project and actually attended the convening. Uh, and I'm interested in the, in the different approach taken to the convening, especially in the context of kind of um, you know, online meeting fatigue um, and bringing together um, practitioners from, from across four nations. I wondered, um, perhaps we can start with you, Katrina, um, and, and with your own introduction um, to the audience as well, um, if you could after that, tell us a little bit more about um, your experience of the process. Everyone, thanks, Barbara. Um, yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit um, as as is common practice for um, Te Amare. So, um, to everyone that's coming, um, to the Pato, um, Mihi Na Kaitiaki o Tina Rohi o Te Tia Tiawa, uh, Mihi Kia Kaito, Kaito Mihi, Kaito Mihi, um, Ina Kaitiaki o Ahi Terrain. Aroha mai. Ahi te reiria me Tors Island, uh, me mihi ki a ke koutou, um, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Um, ko wai au, uh, ko Pihanga te maunga, ko Ngati Tuwhari tō te iwi, um, ko Katrina te maira taku ingoa, uh, he kaumahi au ki te whari pukapaka o Alexander Turnbull, uh, Māori Ora. So I just started there by um, acknowledging the people whose land I'm sitting on, standing on right now, which is Te Atiawa. They are the kaitiaki, the guardians, people who, who hold authority over this particular place. And I also really, really wanted to um, acknowledge um, all the many Indigenous peoples of Australia and Tors Island. Um, yep, respect to you and thanks for, for letting me join this discussion today. Um, so I'm from the Central North Island, where my father is from. Um, and a mountain is Pihanga, which is below um, Turangi Tukua. Um, and I'm a research librarian at the, at the Alexander Temple Library. So the process of, um, of reimagined description. To be honest, when I was first approached to be part of this discussion, um, and it's actually mentioned in the report about the idea of innovation and how we are constantly um, invited to share our opinions and give advice and be experts on particular projects or you know pieces of work. I thought that this might be another one of those um, and I was really I mean I, I was excited because I was like oh yeah cool there's all, all these other um, Indigenous people from around the world and also other people of colour. Um, so, so I was a bit skeptical to be honest but, exact, but actually from the first day um, I think the grant, the because we're all coming together from a similar place, and that became apparent really quickly. Um, even though, you know, I'd never been involved and in, I never talked to anyone in North America about um, description, description of practices before. 
straight off the bat, you know, everyone had some of the similar problems. Um, we could, it felt like a support group in a way because we'd been operating so long in our little areas and not having the connections to really share, um, share those concerns with. One thing I found really interesting was that we all, it was an English focused, well, everyone was speaking English, that was Sadalinga Franca for this. Um, but yet there are so many different interpretations of what words meant, of what it meant to people, was a lot acknowledgement, something we use all the time, you know, like I just acknowledged on the mana whenua of, um, of Te Whanganui Atara, which is Wellington Harbour, um, but acknowledgement means something completely different in some parts of the States. So that was a really important learning for me to, um, to, 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 to get an idea of how actually we think that these words that we use that are safe and neutral, um, they're not, <laughs> not at all. Um, and I also quite enjoyed the, I thought the Shift Collective worked really well, bringing in the facilitators so that people like Mary Lee could actually be involved in the discussion. It wasn't, she, um, they were people from OCLC, they weren't completely, their time wasn't totally taken up with trying to manage the, the Zoom calls and you know, mm -hmm. coordinate the meetings. Um, I don't know, Damien, did you, what, what were your thoughts? I'm very much singing my song. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have to admit, my, my first impression was, was very much the same as yours. Um, I mean, I, I'm not as young as I look, um, so it's not my first time around this particular barbecue, and I know that <laughs> I stand on the shoulders of giants that have been doing this since, well, basically since records started being created about us. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely went in with it, um, what I normally do, which is I'll take the opportunity because I know I get to speak with other Indigenous, Black and First Nations colleagues, and that's always something that I find nourishing. Um, but yeah, I definitely tempered my expectations in terms of um, what kind of change could be achieved or whether it would just be, you know, another set of recommendations that the sector ignores except around specific um, UN years or, or commemorative dates or very specific projects around specific elections. Um, that being said, I, I found the experience very nourishing. Um, I really do like the way that it was phrased around an agenda, um, the way that we talked around manifestos, um, that it was, it was, that spirit of activism was very present for me, which I find very important in this work. Um, it was an incredible group of Black First Nations and Indigenous colleagues, and I think there's something in that where you don't have to code switch. You can save yourself a lot of time um, because you know that everyone in that group understands what it is to be defined or described or to have your ancestors or your culture defined or described by someone that has sometimes less than no idea of, of what they're seeing. And I think for particularly maybe for uh, um, non-Aboriginal, non-Indigenous, non-First Nations people in the audience, it can be hard to understand what that feels like um, to see the entirety of yourself and your kin um, reduced to um, a, a single subject heading or a, a deeply offensive kind of term. Um, so that to me, there's a, a visceral kind of sense. It was also, I think it's the best way to phrase it. It was, we don't get many opportunities to be in a space where we can understand and really frankly discuss a problem. We're often in these spaces to represent a problem and it can be exhausting um, to be, you know, deliberately or accidentally or unintentionally constructed as the representative of a problem, which I know uh, a lot of the library staff I've worked with get sick of hearing some of these issues um, and understand that libraries aren't neutral, but are looking for that next step. Um, but I can't always give people a solution to a problem uh, when I'm still living through the problem. So yeah, I think I think for me the frankness of the language. I really liked that um, white supremacy is is called out and named unequivocally. Um, I think Australian libraries are a little while away from being comfortable with that language. We still don't really use the term racism, um, and I suppose for a lot of people, particularly now with the was it the third round of Nazis, which is actually a thing that's happening? Um, white supremacy tends to invoke that kind of end 
um, mm. of things for people when actually it's just naming a system that we all live and operate in. And I think um, what was really illuminating for me was that even that group of experts, you wouldn't believe how many times we went over some of the words, the very specific words, as you were saying, Katrina, that either meant different things to other people or just the fact that language is so problematic. It has this amazing capacity to change things and to, to kind of contain that power or, or share that power. But yeah, there was just so many words that were, even we were realizing as we were going through that, oh, we can't actually, this, this, this word is not gonna fit here. But we also needed to make it, you know, something usable and understandable to people outside of that circle. I did think the definition of white supremacy in the report was really um, was excellent. You know, it gave that nuance, that sense of, you know, it's not just those connotations, as you say, of extremist behaviour. It's all around us. And I love the the phrase you use, code switching as well, Damien, I think, to help to help some of us understand what that might be like to sort of almost literally have to put in a different lens to have a conversation with different parties. Mm -hmm. um, I guess while, I've, while we've got you on the mic, Damien, um, I wanted to raise one of, the, one of the points in the report is, is the need to balance uh, urgency with perhaps a more temperate approach in addressing these issues. And um, you know, to quote from the report, the work of reparative description is urgent and should be a top level priority, but by its very nature, it cannot be rushed. And I wondered, it's a difficult question, I think, but how can we strike the line between the efficiency mindset that's become so ingrained in our workflows and the trap of using it takes time as an excuse to do nothing? You know, where's the middle ground? Yeah, look, I think we, what is always very clear from these forums is that we have a shared global problem. Um, what we don't have and may never have is a shared global solution. I think that there are, you know, and this sounds like weak source, but I think there are overall structures, there are core issues to that that can be resolved. I mean, I don't think there's any expectation that we'll come up with a national um, thesaurus that will capture the, the needs and, and cultural identities of everyone any more than we have for uh, white culture or society. That, that, we, we seem to fixate on that as an issue, that if we can't get everything, we will do nothing. Um, there's a, a term that's being used here more and more um, that I'm quite fond of, uh, respectful urgency. That, um, and this comes into play a lot with oral histories that we're trying to do with um, elders and survivors of stolen generation organizations. And it's, it's about finding a way to acknowledge that frankness, that, um, people are not going to last forever. We still haven't closed the life expectancy gap um, and we can't expect people to spend the last 10 years they have on this earth saving you know, our institutions from themselves. Um, and as you mentioned, the libraries sector is, is kind of famous for and has this almost pathological tendency to identify a problem, solve a problem, and then automate that solution. And that is, that is never going to work for the kind of processes that this report talks about and the kinds of issues that we come across when we're trying to um, use, and I won't bastardize the, the Audrey Lord quote again, but because I'm sure everyone's heard it, but when you're trying to use the system that is the problem to fix the problem, there are all kinds of weird dead ends you can end up in. And for me, the heart of this issue is a very human one. This comes down to human biases, human arrogance, white supremacy, these assumptions that have been carried wholesale into our systems. And you see it when you digitize a photograph and take only the original caption from the 40s and it's, you know, some missionary ethnographer. We take that information as is and it survives into the next round and you'll see a photo that's just been digitized in 2022 with something, you know, absolutely jarring or offensive. And it's, it's because we don't seize on those opportunities for human intervention. And I know I'd be singing singing to the choir, I preach to the choir here for a lot of people that work in cataloging and descriptive workflows. I know there's a lot of tension around the ways that libraries have cut costs by purchasing records. Um, there are very few staff that are allowed to specialize in descriptive work. You know, I, I remember when it wasn't actually quite common for people to be, who were doing this work, to be able to have time to 
um, research and look up the number plates in photos that didn't have captions to be able to provide more than, you know, kind of man with tree 1923 or something that mm -hmm. that that time is not allotted and people don't have the luxury of doing that anymore. And that I think is part of the problem because that um, the people that I worked with and knew that were very good at that were naturally curious and empathetic um, and would take that time and would give them that time. And I think that's part of the issue. We we have a very human problem and it requires a very human intervention. So that was a very long answer. It's an excellent answer. And I think there's a lot we need to come back to there about who's involved in this. And that includes, you know, vendors and data aggregators and, you know, the complexities of our systems and how we, in some ways, you know, purchase um, metadata is, is part of this complexity. Um, I guess while we're at that kind of pragmatic side of things and that as you say that that library sector urge to find a solution automate a solution um so to kind of tackle that question for for those more pragmatically minded i suppose who might be thinking about it the community agenda you know out of this project is deliberately as Merrily said not a how-to guide for obvious reasons um given the diversity of its audience uh, but here in australia uh, at the very least there's been a um a long standing uh, strong strengthening call for sector guidelines for description of First Nations collections. Uh, in other words, that desire for the for the kind of how to guide that can sit perhaps underneath a community agenda like this. And I'm interested in how realistic that is as a concept. I wanted to throw to Rebecca to ask you, you know, do you think this is something sector guidelines for description of collections? Is this something we can and should pursue? Um, you know, what would be the right approach? If so, who should be involved if you had thoughts on that? Thanks, Barb. It's a really good question. I was just sort of um, thinking that through as I was listening to Damien as well. And I was asking myself, is this something that we do? Um, is this something that does have a sector wide or a global solution? Or is it something that has um, a whole set of local but mandated and um, accountable local solutions um, and I guess I mean I don't have the answer to that <laughs> um, but I do think that one of the things that you run into when you, um, you you look at these things on a sector wide approach is that even within Australia um, different libraries, different organisations approach this work in such different ways. It's resourced in different ways. There are different cultures, organisational cultures and attitudes at play that it's really hard to, I think, come up with one um, thing and say, all right, we're going to apply this to all of the different um, organisations and institutions uh, because some will embrace it. Some will say that won't work for us. Some will say mm, it's not an issue here. Um, being that maybe it is an issue, they just don't realise it. Um, so I think, and what we've seen at the National Library really is that what we've really done is worked with our collections colleagues to find ways that work in our context um, to address these issues. And it's as simple as, um, so um, I look after the Indigenous engagement team um, at the National Library and it's as simple and as complex as um, meeting regularly with our collections management staff to say for them to bring things to us we've had this come into the collection or this is something that's been in the collection for a long while that we're now looking at and we need your advice on how, be how better to describe it or to um, is it being made access accessible appropriately is the finding aid appropriate and all that sort of sort of case by case stuff and also at that at those on those occasions we go to them saying because um, the other thing we do is we see all of the requests for access to the collection that have indigenous content so so many things come across our desk where we go oh well wow. <laughs> that shouldn't be described like that what's that <laughs> language doing there you know um, or at the more extreme end of the thing um there's this item is described as being in the, you know the the uh descriptors that have been attributed to this to this item and imply that it's an authentic um, representation of culture and in fact it's a complete fictionalized account how do you address those things 
so we it's kind of a two-way exchange where we take things that we think need usually quite urgent remedial work because it's pretty bad and they bring things to us that they need advice on how can we do this in the best way and I think it's that vocalised working within your own context and your own own frameworks you know we're working with people who know that particular collection very very well and know what will and won't work in the context of that particular collection and I think yes there's a place for uh, a broader sector globalised approach in terms of setting standards um, and setting um, accountability measures, accountability um, things in place, people have to be accountable to it, they have to, but the actual um, minutiae of how it works on the ground is probably something that can only be, you know, really properly, thoroughly addressed on a, in a local context. Yeah, that makes a huge amount of sense and might even answer a question for some people on that the, the uh, you know, endless question of where to start, you know, that, that, that practical approach of well, what is being um, called up, you know, which collections are being, uh, are being put through to researchers and to kind of be at the very least beginning with, with the questions, the collections rather that are being accessed. Katrina, is that something you can empathise with? Yeah, well, I just wanted to talk briefly about, raise the question about who's driving these these responses, um, because I don't think there's, it's possible to have a global or national, or even specific, and particularly maybe even like a North Island, South Island, Wellington kind of approach, um, because every single community is going to be different, and the complexity is difficult in this resourcing, but it's also really really important. And like Jamie was talking about, it comes back to the humanness of description um, and you know different solutions work for different people so for example I just want to just one concrete example of um, some of the tools people are starting to pick up here in New Zealand um, that I'm sure you've probably heard of in Australia as well as um, well because we already have Na'u Pukutukutuku which is like um, Māori subject headings that the National Library and Te Whakakaukau and Turupi Whakahau which are different organisational groups in New Zealand um, work, uh, drive and are part of and um, authorise for libraries in New Zealand to use the subject headings. Um, but, I mean, that doesn't necessarily apply to some other, you know, there are problems with that, but it is a really, really great tool. Um, but also uh, traditional knowledge labels is one that I'm not, mm. yeah, yeah, but you're nodding here, cool. Um, it's <laughs> one that, is quite new um, to us anyway. And there is some drive from some particular iwi for us to, to, to embed that. Um, and that, and it's a res responsibility to, to, re to respond, to reply. And as a result, you know, we're like, okay, so instead we don't, we're not really sure what it is. So we're gonna learn about it and think about, okay, so we have to get in touch with the vendors and think about how are we gonna, apply these different badges and how this is applied to content with like multiple multiple contributors from because we don't generally Māori don't identify solely with one Bano, solely with one iwi or tribe so how do we deal with that complexity but it's a really exciting tool because it is being driven in a way from outside of the library people are holding us up being like well what are you doing and um, how can we make this work how can you make this work for us um and that's awesome, but also relies on, on, on Indigenous people having the resourcing and the time um, to be able to do it. Um, so it's great to put our ideas out there, but I'm a little bit, in some, like we need to take some responsibility um, when it comes to putting forward ideas, but we also need to be prepared for people to not want them. No, um, it's, it's, the, it's their data. Um, mm they didn't necessarily ask for us to have it. We do, um, and in New Zealand, it's a little bit different because we have a, well, I don't know if it's different, but we have a responsibility in the National Library as a current entity um, and with our, what we call our treaty Waitangi settlements with particularly legislative obligations that we need to follow through. Um, and the library, I think, is quite good at, at responding to that. Um, what's well, getting better than it has been in the past and not being so concerned 
about having to control everything. Mm. Uh, we let ourselves be governed a, bit, a lot more by what Māori want. Um, again, there's you know there's issues with that. We're all under resourced, and we are in that you know we're a, we're a large organisation, so I don't know what it's like working for a really small one um, that, with absolutely no support. Um, but perhaps that's part of our obligation too. Is like well, even that we actually need to reach out a little bit more and provide. Like practical guidance with people, organisations about how to make those those tentative steps because there is that paralysing fear mm. for people. Mm. Um, and now is the time. I feel like now is the time to push forward. So yeah, such a momentum out there. Um, there is, and there are a few. Um, I think we might touch on um, shortly some of the more sort of systemic solutions if that's the right way to put it in terms of community involvement and and training and staffing and so on um, but whilst you've touched on those again those sort of practical solutions notwithstanding the the caveat that larger institutions might have um, despite being resource constrained might have more resources um, than others um, Merrily mentioned the sort of um, uh, nascent I think mechanism um, within Trove Rebecca um, the um, the sort of right of reply uh, mechanism uh, built in to, um, to Trove so that um, culturally sensitive content can be reported. I just wondered if that's been taken up, um, if you have examples of the way in which that has been used, the sorts of changes users have requested. Yeah, so that uh, mechanism, it came about um, as uh, one of the outcomes of the refresh of Trove um, about two years ago, and it came out of a report that um, had been completed a little bit earlier that um, sort of outlined um, what some of the issues were in the Trove space in terms of cultural um, appropriateness of Trove as a as a as a tool and as a site, and um, what could be done to make it a, a safer, more comfortable space for people who don't come from the, I guess. Um, dominant paradigm, I guess. Um, and so one of the recommendations was very much that there be a mechanism for um, feedback from community to Trover to the National Library about the content and that there'd be a way that um, community members could say, hey, this is, you know, this photo should be here, it's men's business, or um, you've misidentified this person or this um, place, it's actually, you know, this. And so the way um, all, you know, um, this is this painting depicts a secret um, cultural practice that shouldn't be seen publicly, any number of things. And so the way that it was approached was we developed a form that um, sits alongside um, Trove records and gives people the opportunity to fire off a, a, a notice to try in fact it comes directly to the Indigenous engagement section it's never been something that has been vetted by Trove or has gone through any other mechanism it's always something that's come directly to us um, and we've always engaged directly with people who sent it to us and I think that's really important because it's not about um, you know I think if you're going to Put cultural, um, for want of a better way, cultural safety um, measures. You've got to make the whole process um, ensure that the whole process is in line with that. The whole process is comfortable and safe, and mm -hmm. um, you know, one that people are going to feel um, comfortable to engage with. So yeah, um, right. it's always been my team and myself who, who deal with those. Um, and in that form. Um, those of you who haven't seen it, it gives people the opportunity to not only say this is um, something you need to know about, but to say this is why you need to know about it. And there are a few categories of sensitivity that people can nominate. One of the um, things that um, that has highlighted to us is that um, as an approach is that while it's good for people to be able to say there's men's business in this, there's women's business in this, um, this depicts a deceased person or um, you're using a, a, an idea of someone who's deceased and it shouldn't be 
showed and all that sort of thing. Um, it also doesn't allow for the finesse of content that might tick a few of those boxes. Mm. So mm. this is secret and sacred. It's also men's business. And by the way, the man in that image, in that photograph, um, you know, involved in that ceremony has passed away and should be referred to by sorry name. There's no right. way of saying all of that. Right. Um, and that is something that um, would need some attention, I think, going forward. Um, to go to your question, my Barb, of the uptake of it, I'd be um, uh, I'd be lying if I said that it was, I'd be disingenuous if I said that it was uh, something that had been taken up really strongly. Um, it was something mm-hmm. that uh, people used a lot when it first appeared and the usage of it has tapered out a bit. And I think that's a bit to do with... Um, the core audience of Trove, um, I'm not sure that, and I think it's a combination of things that I don't know that there are a lot of First Nations people that use Trove, and I think um, of the First Nations people that do use Trove, I would think, and my Trove colleagues would be, um, you know, much better place to, to talk to the statistics around this, but I think that the highest used part of Trove would be the newspapers um, section for family history for, um, you know, and there's nothing we can do about those, and yeah. you don't get that option there. So it's kind of a, I think it's a usage and an awareness thing as much as anything. And there's some work that could be done there. There's some work that can be done with the form, like I was saying, that would make it um, probably less um, daunting to use, I guess, yeah. for one of a better way of putting it. And the other issue we found, if I'm going to be completely honest, is we had people misusing the form particularly early on. We had people who just wanted to, there's no other, or there wasn't at that stage any other really quick, um, immediate way to um, contact Trove while you're in a cl- in a record going, ah! So we get <laughs> all manner of things that just weren't related. And just so there's, irrelevant. there's a bit of that to finesse as well and to work out. Um, <laughs> yes, we've had some really, really, really important um, things reported to us through that form. Like having said, you know, having said all that about the limitations of it, about the limitations of the use of it, we've been told about, you know, I was just looking um, at what some of the examples are and there was, you know, we've been flat told that, hey, you've got a seasonal calendar up there on Trove that should not be there. That is restricted cultural knowledge and the public should not be accessing it. So that gave us the ability to um, suppress that item on Trove so that it's no longer visible to the public. And to um, and I noticed that somebody's asked um, the question in the chat about Trove being an, you know, an aggregate of records from not just the National Library, but from many, many, many partner libraries and archives of museums and other partner institutions. And to that extent, there is a limit on uh, what we can, can do. Um, certainly, if it's an item that's in the National Library collection, we will not only suppress the item on show, but make sure that whatever needs to be done with the metadata in the library catalogue is done as well. Mm. Um, and whatever needs to be done with the Trove record, um, obviously we can do that. But if it's something that sits in a partner collection, um, then we can, you know, provide advice about about that item to to the partner. But it's always a bit of a, a tricky one. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it gives us the opportunity to fix things. It gives us the opportunity to suppress things that we weren't aware of. Um, and sometimes, like the other example that I was going to mention was we had somebody contact us about um, the summary that was given um, in a trove catalogue record about a book, and it was a really... Um, that's something that we can do something about because that's a field that, you know, is it's a trove specific thing. And so there was a a very, very, very old summary for a very, very, very old book and it read like an opinion piece and it was um, really quite inappropriate. And so that gave us the opportunity to fix those sorts of things so that we're not having things there that are, you know, not we talk about things being othering and um disenfranchising and all those sorts of things, but things like that can be just straight up traumatising and that's what we want to, you know, fix. 
that's a case for immediate action. And I can yeah. see you've, you've partially answered anyway. I think Jeremy uh, Sybil from South Australia's question in um, the Q&A there about uh, are the organisations um, notified if, if uh, yes. uh, a response has been put onto their holdings. Yep, so that's a yes. Um, that's really useful. And I think it, it I mean, it raises a question of those, you know, there's the there's the action that can be taken locally at an individual level um, right through to that kind of big, unwieldy juggernaut infrastructure. Um, and uh, I guess perhaps I'll, I'll throw to you, Damien, to, to just ask, you know, are there other areas that you think might be ripe for collaborative action um, at this bigger scale, you know, either the NASLA consortium level, um, the LIS sector, vendors, data aggregators. I, I realise we're in the Australian context here, but uh, any thoughts? Yeah, look, I mean, without getting stuck in the, the trap of finding a solution to very complex issues, to, it's, I suppose it's always really struck me that um, first and foremost, I think you really have to take a knife out before you try and staunch the bleeding. And <laughs> we haven't, um, to be really blunt. Um, the, the, the violence and language rife through these collections um, is still there and inviting community in, no matter what mechanism you're using, to experience that firsthand when you know it's in there is an act of violence. And we cannot expect community to be excited about doing that. Those of us that live and breathe in these spaces have, have learned to, uh, we can suck it up, we can just leave the knife in because it won't bleed as much, but the, this, this violence is endemic in how we engage with these collections and it's, it's hard to minimize. I mean, it, it's a tricky example, but um, we've got people like uh, George Augustus Robinson and his papers that contain incredible amounts of cultural knowledge, but his biographies and catalog notes read as a laundry list of accomplishments. At what point when we have in, you know, let's go with someone like Captain Cook, um, in his own words that he murdered people, would you not add that the, the murderer subject heading? Would you not add We would never, and I have never seen that done, even when these people freely admit in their own journals, which are part of our collections, that they have straight up killed people. That's never part of the conversation. And I can't imagine that, you know, contemporary mass murderers would be given the same leniency if we were to catalogue and seek out their material. And so for me, it's, it's hard to figure out these two issues because really um, the secret, sacred gendered material in the kinds of institutions that we have here are really not huge. I mean, it, it, it's there, but we don't actively collect it anymore because it's not offered to us. It's very rare for um, First Nations and, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to, to willingly give up that which is secret and sacred. People would rather take that to the grave and always have. Um, there are instances where that knowledge has come into these collections through a number of means, but I think we fixate on this idea of secret, sacred men's women's, which is important, but the bigger issue is the missing knowledge. And that's sometimes just people's names. It's just the location where people are standing in these old photos. It's the stories that were never seem to be important that are attached to material. And that can be done without getting dragged into really, really contested kind of cultural spaces. And I think we, we focus on this idea of how to cultural protocols, everything must be sacred, but we don't allow communities to engage with these collections and inform us because it's still such a violent thing to experience. Um, and I think that there is, you know, maybe it's more useful to think of how not to guide and a how-to guide, like that, that we can challenge some of the ways that we, we talk about um, white history and white supremacy, that those are relatively, I mean, compared to, to this other end of the spectrum, much easier to tackle. It's much easier to go through and find all of your founders and settler colonists and do a quick cultural read of their bio and see how that hits with different groups. That And to me, that demonstrates a lot more than knowing that, you know, three items out of six million are being held according to cultural protocols. I would much rather see that the, the stories that this country continues to tell about itself are informed with a broader cultural perspective. And I mean, that goes for, it used to be the, very much the same for women that were left out of the record um, and told what they could read and had collections curated for them. Um, 
very famously WA, the state librarian, was written a letter. This was back in when it was JS Batty back in the day, was written a letter in the newspaper directly to him from a woman, so, you know, complaining that there was there was nothing in there for her to access. And um, he said that everything you need is in the cooking and gynecological sections. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. We're being told or have been for the last 200 years told what Aboriginal people need to access. Um, and it's everything else is still bound within these quite quite violent spaces. Um, so to me, look, we could work on shared thesauri. These things already exist. You know, it's a, um, subject headings are good and it is a game changer to see something described as um, you know, a medicine or lawman rather than um, mytholo mythology or folklore. Um, we're seeing here at the library in New South Wales, new guidelines that explicitly show people why it's important to use different language. That referring to someone as a, uh, just an, an Aboriginal worker, when actually that picture is of a domestic slave, um, that this is, that, sorry, an enslaved person that the, these subtle shifts in language, um, and we're seeing that in Europe, they're moving away from describing people as a slave and are saying that this is an enslaved person, that this was done to, to people. Mm. This, wasn't some, this person wasn't born to serve. This isn't part of this, this weird old way of thinking about human hierarchies. This was done to a person. And I don't think it's much of a reach for, for even the most conservative among us to to recognize that awful things were done to people and we can be upfront about that and back to your point about that that subtlety of language really really matters Katrina did you have something to add there well, I was just going to say you, you'd, you'd hope you'd hope that people would be okay with some of that um and I just <laughs> want to there's a question in, in the um in the chat which I was talking a little bit um the first question there I'm just going to go back to it because it um how does this apply to LGBTQTI? Um, and I just want to think of just one example of, of how, like, like for me, I mean, so as, as, a, as a cis, cis woman, um, for me, that stuff is all part of the colonial project. Um, you know, various identities existed before, we were discovered um, and they exist now. Um, and there's a lot of different conversations within communities, you know, some more conservative aspects that are challenging that, but, um, but it's a part of a past that shouldn't be forgotten, shouldn't try to be rewritten. Um, so I just want to point to the, um, the best practices, the Better Data Best Practices document, I think it was, uh, that was released recently about trans, and gender diverse peoples um, that we in the library are actioning um, and I'm hoping to, to to look at it at that through a Māori lens and sort of also embed some um, Pacifica um, get some advice from our, our Pacifica colleagues as well around that um, oh, I have some other points about <laughs> um, <laughs> But but there there are a lot of problems that though we talk about mm -hmm. it in the report about having to you know actively look up slurs to find information about yourself um, and you know that's a huge people like oh but that's how things were discussed at the time uh, it was mm -hmm. um, and I'm not we don't want to erase history because that history is part of us it's embedded within us um, but there must be a way to for the expectations or description to shift mm. so that we aren't traumatized. Like why mm. would people come and come and want to come and search for that? Absolutely. And that makes me think, you know, relates to, to some of the questions that are coming up about um, enhancement of records and addressing metadata, changing metadata, the practicalities of metadata fields and, and how this how these problems can be can be tackled. I'm seeing a, um, a, in the Q&A, for example, um, someone's written, I love the idea of involving communities in enhancing records, but feel anxious about the idea of payment or compensating them for their work. Are there mm. examples where communities have been fairly paid or compensated? Well, I'm also thinking about Damien's comment, you know, are we asking people potentially to come in to address something that is full of, of, um, of harm? Um, and what is the 
what is the you know the sort of right way around i guess it's leading to a broader question damien about the thinking of libraries when it comes to formal qualifications and workplace experience do you know who do we need to to bring into libraries is it that simple even if libraries uh, have adjusted their thinking what are the practical obstacles yeah. here yeah look nothing is ever simple especially not when i'm involved i have <laughs> things to keep up for myself um i suppose look i when i started in my role over here one of the first things that i kind of insisted on um was standard flat rate so i think following inflation i think around 120 dollars an hour um, for anyone we ask whether that's going into an exhibition or whether that feeds into um descriptive work um that's just that, that's fairly standard now but i mean i've had some success with projects like storylines in wa where you can create a i suppose to to bastardize nakata's work you can kind of create an online version of that third space you can jettison what is not needed and what is what does not spark joy and as long as you can reference one-to-one -one back to those images journals, um, collection items, then for me, creating that space where you can transform it at will and immediately as a First Nations person. Um, sure, but I mean, most people are just trying to access something that they sense belongs to them or tells part of their story. Very few people are engaging with our collections outside of kind of the specialized research space uh, because they give a crap about the next 40 generations of people accessing that. That's a very specific passion we have as, as library workers and people that work here. And I think we have to be reasonable and expect that not everyone's gonna be interested in making sure things are future-proofed from a cultural perspective, if that's even possible. I mean, we're talking about deep time here, then, you know, we're pushing 100, 120,000 years are our knowledge system. So 230 years is, is very much kind of toddler time. Um, it's, it's very hard for me to pass when we talk about permanent collections, when we talk about, um, you know, access forever and multi-generational systems that need to be, you know, the, the ways that we work with formats in libraries. Um, when we're talking about you now a combined several hundred years, which is a very small scale of time, um, I mean, I'm not a librarian. I did not finish the qualification. Uh, and for many years, I was called a shambrarian. Um, but I suppose for me, there's work that when Beck and I are doing as part of the ALIA um, advisory expert group, uh, which is looking quite explicitly at professional pathways. And what I think has always struck me with every community group I've worked with, and often we're talking, you know, just sitting in a remote town or community with a hard drive of images and writing handwritten notes and letting people experience connecting to that material without all of this context or structure, physical or digital, uh, is how much people know and how somebody that's run a small community office has pretty much every qualification you would want for an entry level or even experienced library worker. Um, and we have never, ever made the effort to map that for them. We expect people to translate their life experiences, their cultural knowledge and authority into our sector. And, you know, some of us managed to do that uh, because, you know, I'm a very well assimilated <laughs> second generation black queer. I know how to move in these spaces, but it's impossible to imagine, you know, time poor elders that may only have 20 years left and would love to spend their days sitting in a room with old photos and calling up community members and asking them about them, have all of the skills to navigate those spaces, have all of the problem solving and information seeking behaviors that we would need to, to form that qualification, but don't have the time or money to do a, a three-year degree or even a, a one-year master's course. So I really think a, a huge part of that is our sector mapping those professional skills that we have, you know, let's, let's be Let's be honest, there's, there's a certain amount of prestige and cred that comes from being a capital L librarian. And I think, you know, maybe previous generations of, of librarians have been a little bit protective of that title and have seen their role as, as something that should be earned and that you should be able to speak our language before you're given the keys to these kinds of um, gates that we still control. 
I also didn't really pass library school. Um, <laughs> I did the absolute bare minimum to get a certificate in postgraduate <laughs> study because I, I did not have the time um, to do study. I definitely didn't have the money. I mean, so I grew up in a solo family, you know, so, solo parent family on the benefit. Um, I, you know, failed school. I'm one of those people who, does, who did their last year student three times and actually just, you know, didn't really do much that last time. <laughs> but still managed to pass. But the thing is, is that um, mm. not all of us take that direct route. Mm. And that life experience that I had when I was, you know, failing, it was, it was important to me being the person who I am now. So, you know, just be careful not to write people off mm. when they don't pass and go straight to university. Mm -hmm. um, well, what we, one of the, I don't know if it's a tool or if it's like a strict procedures or policy um, that we have is that because we're a government agency, um, it means that it's easier for us to um, to justify having interns from various communities come in and do do work with us. And it's not when I'm saying intern, I'm not saying that hey, here's a collection you have to go through there and name all these people and give us. Information, it's more. It's more like at the at the moment, last or recently, they've been coming and doing workshops, sitting with people, you know, show them how to how I do simple things like housing negatives and um, how how do they go about uh, designing a, a exhibition and writing captions, and it's a lot less, I'd say, extractive is the term that was used in the um, OCLC. Um, it's about sort of turning that and be like, rather than the library saying, what can we get out of this? More like, what obligations do we have to people? Um, I mean, we can't do it for every single group because of, um, well, there's a lot, there's, a lot <laughs> there's quite a few Māori groups out there, um, but we can make a commitment to do as many, to help to support as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. um, one way we, we do get information to do with um, looking at our descriptions is if, once a tribe has gone through its settlement, um, they might make contact with us to be um, well, with a number of heritage organisations, um, which is actually one important thing to make in the past few, to mention when the past few years, the heritage sector has been much better at not expecting particular groups to go to every single institution on its own. Mm. Um, and because it's exhausting, you know, it's exhausting mm -hmm. going to one library, let alone a library, an archives, museum, another museum, and it's just in one city, and then having to go down south and go to another one, then go to another office. Instead, we've actually been uh, pulled up on it and, and been like, yeah, actually, it's not working for us either, so let's, how about we collaborate a lot better and get a single point of contact, and then we deal with the administration from there. Um, you know, we, we take on some of that burden, some of that cost. Uh, and that means that we can bring people in, we can show, we can have like a face-to-face, -face, we have food, we follow our, we have mihi whakatau um, and follow the, I guess you call it traditional sort of ways of welcome. Um, and then we spend like, you know, it's good two hours in a room with taonga, uh, with, with collections. Some of them we know are problematic and we're really open about that. We're like, can you tell us how we should be doing this better? Um, and what that does, we can't fix everything in that one day, but what it does is it sets a relationship. So mm. it means that every now and then you get an email from someone who say, hey, I'm going to be in Wellington. Do you have half an hour to talk about this? And is that cross-institutional, Katrina? Did you say that's not just the library that's sometimes working with other museums? And Sometimes it is. Sometimes, um, mostly pre-COVID, we would sometimes go over to Archives New Zealand as a group, or Archives yes. New Zealand would come over to us, um, or we would have people from different institutions and in, in, as part of that group as well, mm. um, so that they can make connections at the same time. Um, and, you know, sometimes you, know, you go for months without any interaction whatsoever. I mean, of course, you know, they, they're trying to deal with their health problems in their communities. And so then sometimes you have a rush of three in one week and you just have to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. like, and, yeah, okay. You know, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't go to this meeting. Um, we have to prioritise. 
the opportunity yes. to yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Damien yeah just um, exactly exactly what you're saying Katrina and I suppose what I find is people are, are still trying to Bungaree me um, I don't know if people have heard of Bungaree but he was quite famously taken on the ship with Flinders to act as the basically the cultural liaison and language translator for what was supposed to be, you know, all the way around Australia. And if you can imagine how preposterous that as a notion is, we still do that to people. I mean, what skills do you want? Because um, not every black fella is good at running a room full of people that range from cranky to delightful to traumatised. I mean, the trauma thing when you encounter in collections, as Katrina was saying, I mean, Honestly, in my experience, white people are the only ones surprised by the violence in our catalogues. Um, we know, we know that when we're looking at pictures from colonial sources or records describing us in the 1830s, we know that that is not. We're surprised when it is empathetic, when it has, that's what surprises us, that's what stands out. And I suppose we, we keep misunderstanding or, or, or kind of professionally gaslighting people into, um, I've seen, First Nations and Aboriginal staff members come in that just want to do an IT job. They just want to work in IT. They're not doing smoking ceremonies on routers. They just want to fix computers for staff. There's no cultural element. They have their cultural needs met outside of their work. Mm. That person ended up being essentially like bullied into working on cultural projects with other First Nations staff to the point that they left to become a bouncer at a casino. Um, that, Whereas there are people that are very, very good and, and some of us that get into this space knowing that what we're going to be doing is working in culturally loaded spaces and negotiating. But it's never made clear in the role descriptions, the way we assess and define what the work is going to be done, it, it's never quantified. And if you want my skill set as a cultural negotiator, pay for it. If you are going to be putting me at risk, if you recognise, which we do now, that this is not a culturally safe environment, then I want hazard pay. Mm. And is you want it to be articulated, right? right? What that skill set is. I want to know when that's going to happen to me and what the expectation is. And we don't yet, I mean, and there is work happening to address this, but that to me is one of the big issues. We assume, and whenever a First Nations or identified role is advertised, um, we advertised one recently here for a descriptive librarian working within manuscripts. I don't believe it was actually filled uh, because again, we don't have the networks to draw on and we didn't make it easy for people to translate their own experience, but you get into a role like that and I've done this before. And you're like, wait, you actually just want me to, to call people and get cultural permissions. Whereas, you know, I'm trained to do descriptive work. Mm. Mm. For me, the future is gonna be amazing when you've got First Nations staff describing why materials. When you finally get complaints that actually this record about, you know, Macquarie is way too black, we need to whiten it up. <laughs> we can get to the other end of that and then find some some equilibrium so i can see sort of two um issues being identified here is one is our um perhaps inability or reticence or um you know complete unawareness around the need to articulate a skill set for these sorts of roles and to remunerate that skill set appropriately and to obviously recruiting uh with with the um appointee fully aware of what they're they're yeah. going into and the other a, one is that you're sorry go ahead sorry sorry but that just to me reminds me of what you were asking before about what mm. if anything could be achieved on a national or international level it would mm. be something like that like moving away from these soft words like indigenous ways of working to to getting Aboriginal, First Nations, Indigenous, and Black people together to actually like quantify some of that. Where because we know that if it's a, a professional job to be paid for, we are going to be able to quantify some of that. We're not quantifying all cultural experience, but you know, I think everyone, particularly non-Aboriginal um, and white staff, have maybe had that experience where there's a very, very unhappy, loud Aboriginal woman in the library, and the panic. <laughs> The panic that and that person is quickly handballed to the nearest brown person, whether or not that person has any like training in socio psychological support, or whether they're in the middle of describing some manuscripts. That we we just you know that it's a skill you don't have, but you don't necessarily identify it when when those of us that do have it. And I've seen plenty, I should say, plenty of. Um, black fellow staff that don't have that skill but are very good at other things but I would never put them in a room where it's a really tense negotiation around cultural commissions mm. I think that there's a real piece of work to be done there 
nationally at least, around elucidating what that actually is. I was just thinking one way, one way that we do train in-house in a way, which is that arrangement and description team is that. So, so my, my, I'm a research librarian Māori. My job isn't to describe everything that is Māori. My job isn't to apply all of the subject terms or to do all of the things. Is that, that actually that's everyone's job. Mm. Everyone mm. in our team is expected to do that. Um, you know, we give them training, but and I'm there to give to give advice to um, to mentor people if they need it. To you know, to there are some things that some expert, some you know, specialized knowledge is needed, but. You know, and the team culture is that we need to actually lift the capacity mm. and capability, and that it's not shouldn't all rest on my shoulders or the other um, Māori specialists who work in very different roles, um, mm. because it, it's, it's all of our responsibilities. And I know that that is embedded into performance plans all the time, and but you know we are yeah, so. <laughs> yeah into that talk, mm. for, you know. But, you know, like, actually make it part of the work. It's just part of the workflow. Mm. You'll, you won't even think about it. Mm. It's been mm. normal. Rebecca, are you going to say something? Um, yeah, I would just add that um, I'm going to preface this by saying that the conversation about how do we get more um, First Nations people in the library sector is an incredibly important one. And I'm really, you know, Damien's mentioned that conversation that he and I are a part of as part of the EAG with Alia, and it's a really, really important thing to do. Having said that, I really, really strongly caution against seeing increasing numbers of um, Indigenous, Black, First Nations people in libraries as being the silver bullet mm. to address... Um, the issues that we're discussing because it's not for all the reasons that Damien did, but that, that Damien outlined and, and spoke about, you know, around the burden, around that not everybody has those skills, um, not everybody wants to come to work in a library to do that, you know. Um, I have um, First Nations colleagues um, who, you know, work in very different areas that have nothing to do with, um, you know, decolonising anything or, or working on the issues that we're discussing and that is perfectly okay and people should have the right to do that. But I would extend that to say that if um, by putting this burden on Indigenous people um, to address these issues, um, it's almost distracting and shifting the responsibility and it's saying this harm was done to you but your people, now you fix it. Mm. And I don't think that's a healthy or um, long-term assist. You know, it's not an approach that's going to it's going to work. <laughs> to put mm. it bluntly, mm. um, and it's not healthy and it's not fair. And it's this is why we get burnout. Absolutely, and it's I think it's an important caution as well in that um, what. I perceive to be a huge gap in community relationships with libraries, relationship building, actually that very first step of having a relationship, you know, for libraries also not to be assuming that once a first point of contact has been made that the, you know, the problem is solved and right, you'll be the person who and works and with us now. You know. As Damien alluded to as well, not making the assumption that if we, you know, we connect with the community that they're interested in anything more than we have a record of, their language or their culture or something that's deeply important to them, the assumption that they're going to be interested in um, helping us do anything better or in the way we describe that material, it's what's in that for them. Yeah. That's, and they've already know, got their, their knowledge is already there locally. They've already got yeah, their correction. They've got it. <laughs> right. Stories. They, they don't need to make sure that the libraries, I mean, it's depiction is what is in the library. And for some people, that the distrust with institutions has been going on so long that you don't see the relevance. You're like, why would I bother correcting that? Everyone that reads that yeah. is a white person that's not going to care anyway, is a researcher that's not going to actually reach out and redefine this. They're going to lean on these other non-Aboriginal researchers and their perspectives. It's it's that that sense of kind of hopelessness. And I suppose for me, this this idea that we acknowledge the power we have, like, there is, there is never a situation where a state or national 
library or archive or institution approaching a an individual family or even a, a larger Indigenous community where that power balance is even remotely even, mm -hmm. where, you know, libraries can complain about their lack of resources. Have you been to a remote community trying to run a small library? <laughs> like $10,000 you just spent flying, you know, this used to happen. CEOs and boards flying out to these small communities for a photo op and to launch some little project that would last a year. The money you just spent on that was enough to sustain that that local keeping place for for 20 years mm. it, it's very galling to be told constantly that there aren't the resources to fix the problem that we made can you do it now please <laughs> if it's a problem that we identify as a sector then you have to resource it i think it was russ latham that said at um, a nesla talk um from from tasmania we don't have a problem with resources we have a problem with prioritization yeah spot on yeah yeah. I think that's yeah. it. Sorry, Katrina. Oh, I was just going to um, add that power dynamic. Um, there was a protest at Parliament a while ago that's talking you know, about mandates and vaccinations and everything. And um, and in that time, someone had graffitied part of the National Library, not much, but just the National Library of New Zealand, and they graffitied it with National Library of someone else. And instead of reacting aggressively towards that uh, national librarian took it on as a as a um something to reflect on and mm. i found that really promising you know yes yes indeed i think a few years ago that probably would not have happened well i mean you know, a few decades ago that wouldn't have had the same response mm. um but then again yeah we need to make some like practical changes like prioritization when mm. collections come in um, and description comes in, mm. we number we, we prioritise all of our collections and if there's Māori content, te reo content, anything like that, then it gets bummed up the list. You know, it's it's a, a simple thing to do. Mm. And it's, it's, a, it's piecemeal, but... Um, it's so, it's so important. Katrina, there was this amazing... Um, I was very spoiled when I first started here. I got to spend some time with um, black curators around Amsterdam and the big institutions there. They, they were looking at decolonization and contested histories. And um, there was a, a few of them and they'd started doing this thing where there were protest groups that were coming to the library. And some of them were loony kind of right-wing white power protest groups. Others were black protest groups complaining about the way that, and they started this policy of, of seeking out the loudest critics and bringing them into the room. And just taking their lumps and letting people, you know, for the first half an hour, it's, it's yelling, it's tense, but then people actually take a breath and you figure out if there is actually something you can do. I think libraries still tend to avoid the people we think are angry with us when really, if we want to talk about difficult conversations and shifting power balances, it's, it's opening up these spaces to the people we know we've hurt and who are clearly hurt by our practices. But we, we tend to insert people like me and Beck and yourself um, as a safer middle road so that staff like us will wear that violence. I have been punched, screamed at, followed home from communities all because of decisions made by libraries. But the library, I, I think, yeah, we, we need to be able to, to, to wear that. And those conversations are really always productive. Mm. And there is something in the in the sector. It's a discussion um, the the NASA board was having recently um, about this sort of fairly widespread tendent. White can't speak widespread tendency to not like not being liked. You know, to to sort of have that that fear of of pushback that I think we really need to confront almost quite personally in ourselves as practitioners. I'm just aware we've got six minutes remaining and never enough time for this, but it's been a truly wonderful conversation. Um, so I just wanted to pause briefly to say um, thank you to participants for your Q&A comments. Leslie Akers, our friend, we see you there, and a conversation about Australian library standards surely to be held at the next Alia uh, Expert Advisory Group meeting. Um, I uh, wanted to let people know that the, the session is, of course, being recorded and um, it will be provided on the NASLA website um, with a little blog post in due course. You will receive a notification when that's uh, happened. So you can either rewatch or, or share it with your colleagues. Um, a couple of standout lines, I suppose, that have sort of stuck with me um, in the conversation today and, and from the paper as well, the community agenda paper. Um, the work of reparative and inclusive metadata will never be finished. That's one that 
that stood out. Um, Mary Lee's um, comment earlier that this work may be remedial for some and revolutionary for others. Mm. I think, you know, Damien's comment about you've got to take out the knife before you staunch the bleeding isn't, isn't going to leave me quickly. And, and I love that quote from Roxanne Gay in the paper as well. It's just simply, I don't want your shame. I want your fight. Um, and I think that's hopefully the message um, that we're, we're conveying today. Um, I want to thank our very, very wonderful panel members, Katrina, Damien, Rebecca, and of course, um, Merrily, who um, I might like to, to join us for these last few minutes. So I guess I really wanted to give you all the last word. Um, and just if there's anything um, perhaps that's you've seen or want to see in your own organizations that um, can, can move this, can move this work forward um, that is or could move, <laughs> it's moving it or could move it. Um, or Eddie, in the last sort of observations uh, to leave us with today. Um, um, Merrily, did you want to, to throw in anything first? Just um, what a privilege it is for me and for all audience members to have uh, had the opportunity to hear such um, frank reflection and dialogue. Um, I think that one of the things that um, we can all be thinking about is not, you know, how are we going to invite community members in? How are we going to be able to afford to compensate them? But really, are we prepared as organizations to bring them in? Are we ourselves lifting off the burden that we can lift off um, as as allies, as practitioners? I mean, this is this is our profession. Um, so, you know, where are we doing the groundwork to prepare? Um, for others to come in and have that be a comfortable and inviting experience. You only have, this is some kind of market marketing, you only have one chance to make a first impression. If you're inviting in respected members of the community, what impression are you leaving them with? Um, and can that be as positive as possible? So I think that that concept of organizational readiness, are you really ready to make a good lasting relationship and partnership or are you not really quite there yet? I think that that level of honesty is something that we need to um, all come to terms with. So. Beautifully put, yeah. Mm. That's a good point. I would just say be brave, be critical and be accountable. The worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get something wrong. And I mean, honestly, we're sitting on 230 years of wrong. So it's, <laughs> it's gonna be a drop in the bucket. can be quite hard to manage your expectations but that coming back to the honesty about what you can achieve uh saying that you haven't achieved it is better than than just ghosting people <laughs> um <laughs> i'd also um just want to quickly thank my um colleague celia joe olson who is at ifla at the moment mm -hmm. um and she can't be here today but also the one thing that I keep thinking about is that archival description, library description, libraries and archives, they are, you know, the human construct, we made these things. Beautiful. Um, you know, they've existed for thousands of years, they can change. Rebecca, did you have any comments? Um, I agree with Damien, you know, about getting it wrong. I think, I, I don't think there's a day that I go to work and I don't have a conversation with somebody about, oh, for goodness sakes, just give yourself permission to get it wrong. You know what? The world's not going to end. Um, <laughs> and if you don't get it wrong, you know what? You're not going to learn anything. Um, and I can't stress that enough. I think I, in my career, I've seen a hell of a lot of um, what I call um, fear paralysis where people go oh I'm going to get it wrong so they just do nothing which is I can't tell you how many times worse so all I get I guess my best advice can be um, try not to be too so um, paralyzed by that fear of getting it wrong and just try and find that little bit of courage to to take that step make it an informed step don't just blunder in blindly <laughs> But take that step, but be prepared to get it wrong and be prepared to learn. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. I think people assume that we stepped out of the dreaming with all of this knowledge. I learned most of what I know by getting things really wrong in front of elders. I think that's the only thing I would add is like, don't run away and get things wrong about us in private behind doors that we can't open and get into. Get things wrong in front of your, these communities and these elders and get told off by auntie and she'll tell you a different way to try it and that yeah. way will change in 10 years there's no there's not going to be one 
workflow that we can lock in and finally park all this First Nation stuff that's I know is stressing out a lot of your library staff out there. But get get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's not that bad. Perfect finish. Thanks, Damien. Thanks all again uh, so much for your time today. Very much appreciated. Stay tuned for the blog post. So long. Thank you all.